fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five zero AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Michael Hawley. It's a Wednesday. That is correct. I have shifted to Wednesday, Al. Yeah, Tuesday is going to be boring without you. You know, <laughs> I get care with that. It's going to be a quiet, quiet Tuesdays. <laughs> Tearful Tuesday. There you go. I like that. So you're out shopping last night. So you get you get lots of gifts. You get me lots of things. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, best is like uh, I mean, uh, of course. Usually, what happens with the wife? She buys everyone's gifts. She buys her own gifts, and then I and then I just help pay for those things. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how it works, and we we we're fine with that. In the past, I've tried to buy her a gift or two, and she's like return them. Right. So uh, it didn't work well. Yeah, yeah, you don't know what you're doing, right? So what's <laughs> just like to save the step, right? That's right. You know, so. all that extra work. Well, of course. Well, speaking of buying the perfect gift for your wife, we've we've got sci-fi, future world, fantasy writer, crime fiction, all sorts of stuff. So it fits perfect with uh, the thought of you buying something that she oh, would yeah. like. And she would like this. She absolutely would. Well, there you go. So now joining us, we've got an, an author that's written his newest book. is called A God in Hiding. So Matthew Hughes, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Hello, Matthew. Hello. So, Matt, like um, you've been doing this for quite a while, it looks like. So what was, what was it that drew you into the world of writing? Well, it was the only thing that I could do exceptionally well. And I, I've spent my life as a, a professional writer. I got my first paycheck from a newspaper in 1971. Ah. And I spent 30 years uh, as a speechwriter. In fact, I was the top-rated guy in British Columbia. It didn't matter what political party you uh, were working for. If you needed a speech to put a candidate over the top into the leadership and the candidate was an underdog, I was the one they called. Nice. If, and if you knew how polarized politics were back in those days in B.C., you realize I'm the only person in history who's ever done that. <laughs> now you got to come back, come to America and do it. This very much polarized now. <laughs> no, I've, I've had my fill of speech writing. Yeah. I must have written somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 speeches wow. in my life. Does that leave you the, the same feeling that writing a fictional book does? when you write speeches for people? No, I, I used to get $200 an hour speech writing. I don't get that feeling from writing fiction. <laughs> right, right. Well, <laughs> so I guess there's a lot of kind of um, common phrases and things you use in something like speech writing, almost like reviews. Um, yeah, maybe, but essentially speech writing is about creating an impression of the speaker and the event at the time that the audience will take away with them and talk about. Usually don't talk about the content of the speech. They, they talk about the impression they made on them. And that's the same thing with writing fiction. That, that's the result you get. There are OCD people who will niggle over every little detail and so on. But most people say, hey, I really enjoyed that. Or he tells a good tale. And that's what, that's what you're shooting for. Yeah, yeah. And so how does that translate into space opera or science fiction fantasy? Like, um, what, did you have a natural love for that, and that's kind of why you went that way? I was first intending, at the age of 16, I wanted to be a historical novelist. I was reading a lot of that in those days. But I was also reading science fiction, and, yeah, I, I thought to myself back then I could write sci-fi, as I used to call it, or I learned better. Um, and then it just sort of happened one day. It's a lengthy story, but I'll tell it to you if you don't mind. Sure. Um, 
I was sitting on my couch in 1982, coming up to the Labor Day weekend, and I saw a notice in the Vancouver Sun that said there was a right uh, a novel in a weekend contest for the Labor Day weekend. And I thought, yeah, I could do that. I've just got a new typewriter. I moved into a house that had an office where I could work at home. And so I could, you know, not sleep for 72 hours and write. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. And I didn't give it much thought. I thought I'll just start and see where it goes. But I did think, I was reading a lot of Jack Vance back then, and I thought to myself, I'd like to do kind of Gulliver's Travels as written by Jack Vance. And that's what I set out to do. And it was a, a far future society, or several different societies, all sort of built around one weird idea, each one different. And I'd have this poor, helpless character who'd wander from one to another, and eventually some sort of plot or theme would develop, which indeed it did eventually. Um, so I set to, and I wrote 27,000 words in 72 hours, and even had time to polish them a little. And I sent it in and, and did not win, because it turned out it was a, a deeply literary fiction contest. So, you know, my kind of ironic, funny, goofy humor was really not to the taste of the judges. But I kept the manuscript, and some years later, when I had uh, my first word processor computer, I put it on a disk, and then I would add to it from time to time when I wasn't busy making a living. And so by 1987, I had this nice little novel, which I sent to agents in New York, ten of them. Eight of them said, no, not interested. Uh, one said, I cannot conceive of a market for this book. And the other one said, I love this book. I want to sign you, and I'll go out and sell it for you. Right. He did try very hard, uh, and it didn't sell. But he kept getting notes. He told me he got notes from editors saying, this is an interesting, enjoyable, neat little book, but it's not typical, is it? And they were buying typical that year. So it didn't sell. He gave it back to me. He retired, and life went on. But seven years, well, six years later, I sold it to a Canadian small publisher, uh, which was actually part of a big empire, Maxwell, uh, what's his name, Maxwell, the, uh, the guy who stole all the money from his union pension plan. Right. Uh, Robert, Robert Maxwell. Right. Uh, and the book actually got edited and published and came out the week that his empire was being dissolved. And my book went straight to the warehouse and stayed there. Remain. Um, so that was my first foray into science fiction, uh, and it was shot dead twice. Amazing you kept going. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, meanwhile, I had really moved towards being a crime writer, and I was writing short stories and selling them to Alfred Hitchcock. I had a novel come out from Double Day Canada. Uh, I won an award for Best Story of the Year from the Crime Writers of Canada, and that was fine. I even had an agent shopping two novels around for me in New York. And then I saw an interview in a, a magazine with Betsy Mitchell from uh, Warner Aspect Books, Time Warner Element. And she said she was looking for fantasy novels, science fiction novels that were not typical. And I just happened to have one sitting on a shelf for years. So I sent it to her, and she bought it and commissioned the sequel. So that was my first publication in science fiction one. One was called Fool's Errant, and the sequel was called Fool Me Twice. And it sold, more or less, and, and got picked up as a science fiction book club feature selection, two of them combined. But that, that came out in 2001, which was not a good market year for goofy, ironic, funny science fiction. The, the mood of the country turned, the, you know, the American mood turned quite serious. Not much happened in terms of a third book, but... Uh, a rather prominent uh, editor called David Hartwell from Tor said, after a couple of my books were reviewed in his New York uh, Review of Science Fiction, he said, well, I'd like one, why don't you write me one? So I wrote him one. And I, while I was waiting for that to come out, I thought, I really need to get my profile up. So I started writing short fiction, set in the same universe as those three books which I was calling by then the Ark and Age of the Universe. And I sent the first one off to fantasy and science fiction. Got a, within a week, I got a check in the contract, which I didn't know was unheard of. Uh, but they wanted more, so I began writing stories for 
fantasy and science fiction, and then also for Hasselbaugh's, uh, anywhere I could sell them. I certainly found myself in the career of a science fiction fantasy author, even though I was a crime writer at heart. And then it, it just snowballed from there. Uh, Nightshade book said, do you have enough stories for a, a collection? I said, sure, here they are. They published that. Then they said, how about some novels? We'd like three. So, okay, I, I did that too. Rolled on, on and on from then on as a science fiction and fantasy author that almost nobody has ever heard of. That's the, the odd thing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know people who would cut their legs off to get into fantasy and science fiction for one story. It's, you know, it's the summit. It's, it's the best, the oldest, finest science fiction digest pack. I think, I think I've been in there 43 times. And in the bygone days, 40s, 50s, 60s, that would make me a, a megastar of science fiction authorship. But it don't now. It doesn't doesn't work that way anymore. No, no, it's it's all changed. Do you do you like the way the science or not just science fiction, but the way publishing is nowadays? No, no, I don't. Okay. Um, the all the big freestanding houses, you know, like Simon and Schuster and the Random House, they've all been combined into five huge conglomerates, and those conglomerates are run by marketing people and bean counters, not by editors. Editors get told who they can sign, who they can't sign, and that's it. They have to do what they, they're told. Uh, it used to be editors were kings, and now they are knaves, I suppose. Right, right. Yeah. Jacks, yeah. Yeah, not the same direction. So so when you, when you do these, like, um, science fiction as compared to crime fiction, the, there's quite a difference in the writing. Um, do, which do you like doing better then? Which do you feel more natural at? Well, in recent years, I've done much more fantasy of a certain kind. Jack Vance had two main settings that I was influenced by. One is the space opera, and that's what I started doing. But he also had one called The Dying Earth, which is the last age of, of the planet. Um, when science has retreated and magic has come back and there are wizards and ogres and all kinds of stuff like that. And I, I have been writing in that milieu now for a number of years. Uh, I sold dozens of stories set in Old Earth, in the Dying, Age, dying Earth, uh, to fantasy and science fiction and Lightspeed and others. Um, and I've started writing novels, uh, which I am now self-publishing rather than looking for a small press and then self-publishing after I get the rights back. So that's all one that's just come out. It's called A God in Hiding. Uh, it's a kind of sequel to a novel that came out in 2019, which was called A God in Chains. Uh, it's not a direct sequel. It, I took one of the minor characters from the first book and made her the protagonist of the new book. And it's a quest story, and it's wandering around in the dying earth to find things that her employer once found. Uh, I went with a female protagonist in this one, because why not? And, uh, I, yeah, I, I like it. I, I feel comfortable writing about vainglorious, not necessarily all that uh, competent wizards. And mostly, in fact, almost exclusively, my characters are not epic, heroic, I'm going to win types. They're, uh, they're like me. I mean, I, I spent most of my life as a henchman to important, powerful people, leaders of political parties and CEOs of major corporations. They were the people I advised and wrote speeches for. And I come from the working poor, so I know what it's like to be at the bottom of the heap. I was uh, very much a strange creature in those settings. But everybody thought I was middle class and had multiple degrees. And I'm, I'm a university dropout. I could, couldn't afford to keep going anymore. So I quit and got a job as a group. So I like creating these henchman-type characters, these underlings, and they get pushed into situations by their superiors and betters. And then they have to figure out how to stay alive and how to win. And that, that appeals to me a great deal. My crime stories are a lot like that, too. I have minor criminals. I come from a family of minor criminals, or at least, no, put it 
Nice. Uh, a family in which a streak of criminality is definitely observable. Ah. Well. <laughs> many poor, many poor people have to do things right. that uh, middle class people don't have to do. Sometimes you take a risk. You you know can't pay the mortgage, you burn the house down. The trick is getting away with it. My dad got away. With it. So you, you but you um. How, let's say let's say this. How do you describe your relationship with your characters then that you create for these stories? Uh, I am a complete what they call a pantser, you know, somebody who writes by the seat of the pants. I don't so much create the characters as I grow them organically because I become the character as I'm writing the character. And they tell me, the, the guy in the back of my head tells me what they want, what they want to do, what they don't want to do, what to do next. And it's, I sit down, I have a character, I have a, a general situation which is normal to that character, and then uh, something happens that propels the character into a, a lot of peril and trouble, and we work our way out of it. But when you say that, you, um, in essence, become the character, and you work your way through whatever scenario it is that you, you've got them into, um, how do you think that changes you? at the end of it? Oh, not much. I, I, this is normal for me. The thing is, I was a very successful speechwriter because I could internalize the worldview of the person I was writing for, even if I completely disagreed with it, which was often the case. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly left-wing, and I was writing for right-wing politicians and CEOs of billion-dollar corporations. Um, so becoming the person I was writing for was normal. Uh, I had no actual training in it, but because I could do that and had a, a good way with words, that's, uh, that's how I survived for decades, doing that strange work. So you, didn't, you don't actually really feel like you've gone through some of the scenarios you put in then? You can, you can separate yourself from that? Yeah, I, I have a, a mild sense of the emotions while I'm writing it. But I, no, I, I don't. I'm not actually psychotic. I, do, I don't become the character. Oh, well, that would be me. <laughs> there would be a lot of wear and tear. You know? <laughs> well, you know, some people get totally involved, wrapped up in it and stuff, and, and live through their character in a sense. And uh, a lot of the the events they go through, they feel, you know. Yeah. And, you know, depending on who you talk to. And so I always kind of get into that. Um, so now you build these worlds, in essence, uh, that the characters are in. Like you kind of make your own, um, I guess, um, living status and world for these people. How do you derive that? How do you? Where do you take that from? I should say. If I wanted to be fancy about it, I'd say I don't build it; I discover it. Right. <laughs> Things occur to me as I'm going, uh, and I, I put them in. One thing that. Uh, it was way back to 1987 in that first book. I often wondered how we got from Jack Vance's uh, science rocket ships and a world to a world of, of demons and wizards. And I thought, well, okay, I have an idea. And I threw that into the first book, Fool's Errand, just as an aside. At the same time as that, I was reading about uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his life. And he started out as a dedicated alchemist. You know, he was trying to turn lead into gold, that kind right, of thing. Right. Um, and then somewhere along the way, he became pretty much the world's first scientist. And, and there was a change. And he was successful at both. And I wondered, did the rules change somewhere? Uh, that magic used to work, and then it shifted, and now you had to have cause and effect and rationalism. And I thought, well, if that happened, that would explain what happened to Vance's worlds. So I threw that in. And then later on when I was writing more of it, uh, that became the big deal, that the universe that my characters were in was about to suddenly and for no known reason change from science works to magic works. So it's called Dying Earth, meaning it still uh, nibbles in the science into the magic world, or is it now completely in the magic world? Well, by the time it's well established after the interim transition period, it's magic. Yeah. Magic has made to work by willpower. It's a matter of learning how to focus your will uh, and 
Well, it's more complicated than that, but that's essential, is that people who do magic have really powerful and extremely well-trained willpower. Which means, you know, something that would work in our scientific world, not guaranteed at all to work in that world, unless somebody with really powerful will is making it work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's sort of yeah. like, well, you know, yeah. it's sort of 2023 in America. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat, yes. I'm not. <laughs> but their magic yeah, I, isn't working. But they still believe in it more than science. So it's. Uh, have you mixed? Have you mixed both worlds of crime fiction and the space opera science fiction? Have you tried to do that? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, crime fiction. I, I still consider myself a crime writer, and a great deal of what I've done is crime stories, some with detectives and some with just criminals as the protagonists. Uh, set in a science fiction universe. So your so your so your antagonist kind of is your protagonist. Is that is that how? Well, antihero is the term I would use. Ah. I, I, when I was young and reading books, I really liked books with antiheroes because I felt like one. Um, and so yeah, a lot of my characters are. Well, I have one guy called Love Embry that I've written maybe nine or ten stories about novellas and so on, and one novel, and I'm working on a sequel to the first novel. Um, he is a master thief, a forger, uh, sometimes a middleman. He deals mostly in art, and often art that he has acquired by means he shouldn't do it. And he flies around from one planet to another, and he makes deals, and he gets in trouble. And he's basically a high-class criminal. Do you have them as basically they're a good guy? As in, or are they... No, no, they are... My, my characters are not really good guys or bad guys. Embry has his standards. There are things he won't do. Uh, and yet, there are plenty of things he will do that he shouldn't. But this is how he makes his living. You know, most people who are criminals are doing it because that's how they make their living. It's not that they're bad people. The effects of what they do are bad on good people. Uh, but... You know, it's who they are and what they do. Right. I don't make any... Uh, I did write an origin story for Embry. He was a talented young fellow who got sent to a boarding school, and there he came up against a kind of flashman bully, the, the character from Tom Brown's school days, and got framed for something he didn't do and kicked out of the school. And then he thought, well, okay, if I can't do it my way, I'll straightway then I'll deal, you know, I'll, I'll deal with the hand that's been dealt to me. And so he became a criminal and was very successful at it. Right. And, well, quite often the the criminal or, let's say, is what's considered the bad person in the story, um, in their world they're doing what they think is right because they have to sometimes. And it's, uh, I guess you kind of have to describe that character so that the reader understands where they're coming from. Yeah. Um, well, his motivations are clear in, in every story I've done. He's out for himself. He's out to do. He's out to make a living and make a killing if he can. Uh, and he's not bad to anybody because he wants to hurt them. But if he, they have something that he wants to steal, then they, he's going to go and steal it. He is a thief, and thieves steal things. That's what they do. So their motivation is not to injure the person that they're stealing from. I mean, just, you know, it's like Creepy Carcass was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Right. <laughs> he had nothing against the banks. It wasn't ideology or morality. He just wanted the money. That's like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so where do your ideas, where do you think they come from? Are they? Do you think there's something that you pick up from watching others or seeing other people? Oh, I think it comes out of my life. Um I've had an odd and unusual kind of life. I got moved around an awful lot as a kid. Uh, ended up never having any friends, because what's the point of making friends? If three months from now, you've got to be yanked up by the roots and put somewhere else. And I've had a wide experience of life. I mean, I have been a teenage hitchhiker with two bucks in my pocket on a highway somewhere in Alberta as the night comes down. And I've also flown on private jets and, and drunk champagne in the executive suite. So I've seen an awful lot of stuff. And sometimes I've been part of an awful lot of stuff. 
and from that I can draw my instincts, shall we say, uh, or my acquired instincts as to how I think life is going to be and what happens next. Well, in each one of these stories, it, it, is there a, a meaning or a subtext you hope uh, a reader would pick up, even if it's there organically? There's nothing that I'm trying to push at them. You know, here, here's the meaning of things. If it's anything, it's life is what it is, and you have to do what you have to do, and try not to do any harm you don't have to do, but you know, survive and keep on going on. Well, there you go, and you you keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now your influences, obviously, obviously Vance is a big influence for you. Um, what in particular was it about Vance that you lapped onto? I read my first story by him, The Dragon Masters, in 63. It was in the Galaxy magazine, and my eldest brother had uh, a subscription. He would leave it lying around. And that one really stuck with me. That, that was one of the first science fiction stories that I'd ever read. And there was something about the, I would call it the coolness of mood, in the way he told the story and in the way the characters were. And that really resonated with me and always has and always stayed with me. So there's other things. So I, I, I used to be enamored of uh, science fiction and historical novel author, a guy called Lionel Sprague de Camp wrote wonderful historical novels, uh, very accessible to a teenager like me, but they were written for adults. Uh, and I liked his way of telling a tale. I liked the, the picaresque way he went about with his characters and the settings and the way he described them. And he was a big influence. But in my teen years, I read everyone. I read Hemingway, I read Steinbeck, I read Robert Graves, uh, Nikos Kazantzakis, Cretan writer, um, everybody I could get my hands on. I, I, I lived in the library. My house was a dysfunctional place, not a happy place. So I spent most of my free time in the library reading books. When I wasn't reading books there, I would take books out and go sit in my room somewhere, which I shared with two or three brothers, and sit there and read. And, and I just absorbed a massive amount of uh, story-making and, and storytelling. When I got into crime writing, uh, I was very much influenced by Lawrence Block and Donald E. Westlake, uh, and Elmore Leonard enormously influenced me in, in terms of the style of storytelling, uh, having the characters carry the story forward mostly on their, uh, their dialogue. Very, very hard to do. It looks so easy when he did it. And others, uh, James Lee Burke, uh, I think is the most literary crime writer there is. Uh, he's wonderful. And people like Robert B. Parker, again, with a unique way of telling a story that I very much admire and don't think I can handle it, uh, so I don't try. And lots of others. I was a very eclectic reader. Lately, I'm mostly reading uh, old crime fiction and uh, some historical fiction because I'm working on... Uh, we're about to work on a historical novel that I wanted to write since I was 16. Which which area era, era would that be? That would be the immediate year after the death of Alexander the Great. Oh. Apparently, shortly before he died, Alexander sent a ship out to circumnavigate Africa because he was going to conquer that next. And nobody knows what happened to the ship, so I'm making it up. I'm trying to make it up reasonably on the basis of what the, uh, the Mediterranean world was like in those that first year after he died, when it was chaos. In fact. But I'm waiting to see if uh, I get some grants from granting agencies, and I've got an agent out pushing my big book, uh, my, my magnum opus, and which is a historical novel which won an award. I should plug that, I guess. Of course. It's a book called It's a book called What the Wind Brings. And it's about a true set of events that happened in the middle of the 1500s when some African slaves were shipwrecked on the coast of Ecuador. This is about 40, 50 years after the, uh, the Spanish conquered the Inca, but they hadn't conquered this part of the world, the, the jungle coast of Ecuador. And the Africans moved in with the local people and formed a mixed society. And the conquistadors from up in Quito tried to reduce them, is the term they used to use, 
reduce them to servitude. And they outfought them, and they outthought them, and they maintained their independence forever. So it's a happy ending story, which you don't usually get with uh, stories of slaves escaping. Anyway, that was one I, I waited more than 40 years to write, and the Canada the Council gave me a big grant, and I wrote it. Found a small press for it. Uh, won an award, the Endeavour Award. I was the first Canadian title to, to win that cross-border award uh, in like 22 years. And now I've got the rights back, and I have an agent who is looking to see if some bigger publisher wants to take it on. And then we'll see what happens. Great. I'll give you the title again, because there are still copies around, even though the publisher no longer has the rights that you can get them. It's called What the Wind Brings. What makes a good book, do you think? What makes what keeps you reading? What is it? The character? The story? You mean now or when I was a, a vacuum cleaner sucking them up? <laughs> yeah, before before you no, after the vacuum cleaner <laughs> life uh, like today like right now <laughs> what what would keep you going back to a book or rereading it let's say for another time like what 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 is it well when it comes to rereading i can be two to three chapters into a book before i realize i've read it before uh because my memory is starting to go swiss cheese um my case i, read. I suppose I, i'm i read now for entertainment um so i'll I will read like a, a Robert B. Parker Spencer novel in a day, and it's just candy. But it's beautifully done, candy. There's humor in there, and there's also uh, twists and turns of plot. And the character himself, Spencer, and his sidekicks uh, are also interesting people. Essentially, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm looking for uh, an easy style. I don't want to have to work hard at it anymore. I've done enough working hard reading. Um, and a character that I can feel engaged by. The characters are, are really kind of the key thing, aren't they? It's really what keeps the book alive, and it keeps the series alive, doesn't it? Well, everything depends on character. Uh, people who work out plots and then try and slip characters into them, and the characters have to fit the plot, they often end up with stuff that nobody wants to read, or only very, very simple readers want to read. But... Um, I always say that story comes out of character, and then plot comes out of story. And an example, everybody knows Rumpelstiltskin. That is always told from the point of view of the girl. She doesn't have a name even in the story. She has, she's a girl, her father is a miller, and there's a king. And those are the characters, apart from Rumpelstiltskin, who was the only one who has a name. Well, it's always told from her point of view. But if you turn it around, and you say, okay, well... Suppose Uncle Stiltskin was telling this story. He made a deal, and then he got diddled out of it. That's an entirely different story from the girl got into a terrible situation and found a way out. And the same, her father, the miller, this guy used to brag and brag and brag and put his daughter in terrible peril because he told everybody, well, she can spin straw into gold. And the king said, oh, well, I'll take that. And if uh, she doesn't, Produces the gold, I'll kill her. Yeah. So what was his feeling then about what he'd done? Same events, same characters, but depending on where you focus on the character, you get a different story. It's about something different. Perspective. Yeah. 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 And meaning, or theme, if you want. But a meaning is what I would say. It's what it's about, what it means. Do you have a, a process or a way of doing characters that you don't relate to, let's say a female character or a character in a totally different headspace. Um, is there some sort of way you go about that? No. Um, I am the character when I'm writing the character. So when I'm an evil wizard, I'm an evil wizard. I'm, I'm selfish and vain, and I want what I want, and there's enough of that in me that I can put it into a character. I really do. I really do grow them. I, I grow them in my head, in my being, and then they come out through my fingers onto the keyboard, and there they are. I can't explain it. I, I, I had, as I say, I have no training at all in this. I just knew how to do it from the get-go. I guess it's I absorbed so many stories and felt so many characters that I was reading that it just all sank into my unconscious, and it's there to come out. Thankfully, uh, normally when I sit down on the keyboard, out it comes. Right. 
Yeah. I essentially edit what the guy in the back of my head feeds me. Most of my uh, most of my books, I write one draft, and then I polish it, and the first draft is about 90% of finish, and the second draft is the finish, unless I go back and really niggle over little details that I might change, but, you know, it would be like one or two percent change for being the third draft. So, it's an unconscious process. Right. Just sort of, it just sort of happens. Yeah. Yeah, and you flow with it. What do you do? You think about? Are you conscious ever about your your reader when you're writing a book? Then, no, not when I'm writing fiction. I used to be when I was writing speeches, because the audience is a participant in the event. So you have to know what they what they need to hear or what they need to feel. I suppose that, that applies to writing fiction too. That I'm not really aware of it. You, you're conscious about the violence and how you write the violence, or let's say action let's in in your in your books um well i i sometimes do graphic action graphic harm but very often i uh, i characterize it more than i show it people found that I, one of the recent books i've done is called barbarians of the beyond and it was an actual authorized sequel authorized by jack vance's estate to one of his most famous series, which was the Demon Princess series. None of whom were demons or princes, they were master criminals in a space opera setting. And I had a character who was the daughter of slaves who'd been carried off by these demon princes in a raid on a, a little town in a, an undefended planet. And she was determined to come back to that planet, escape from slavery, come back, find something her parents had hidden, it was immensely valuable, and then use that to buy her parents out of slavery. That was her, her agenda, and nothing was going to stop her from doing that. Been raised her whole life with the expectation that that's what she was going to do, and now she was doing it. Uh, so when uh, some very bad people, space pirates, who were liable to get in the way, who were going to stage another raid, in fact, when it came time to question a number of them who'd been captured. Uh, she was like something out of a Shapo cellar. Took the energy pistol and simply incandescent the head of one of them, and then turned to the others and said, now do you want to talk? I mean, she was that brutal and tough at what she was doing, which was unusual for me, and actually it was unusual for Fancy to do much graphic violence either. Uh, and a number of people who read it noted that, but that's what she had to do in that moment, and it worked. They prevented the raid. Or, well, it, when the raid came, they were ready for it, and there was a lot of shooting and killing and people being burned up and so on. But I didn't dwell on the details of that. But that one crucial scene had to be done the way I, I, mean, I did it, I think. Yeah, it was appropriate for what was the story. Yeah. Yeah. What is it you hope the reader gets out of the book then? Enjoyment. I'm an entertainer. If they get anything else, if they get, you know, little insights into existence or the meaning of life and the universe and everything, that's fine. Uh, but basically, I'm trying to make people have a good time reading a story. Right. So now that A God in Hiding is out, what, do you, what are you working on? What do you got going in your mind now? Well, I saw somewhere that uh, the editor of Fantasy and Science Fiction was putting together an anthology of a particular theme. It's the, uh, the place that people go to that there's weird stuff going on, and then there's a story. And I was thinking, uh, when I was house-sitting 12 years ago, I ended up in a little town in Italy, or actually on a, a villa outside of the town, which was a factory for growing olives. Uh, and up the hill from there was this national park called La Foresta Umbra, the Forest of Shadows, and it was a remarkable place. Uh, it's an actual survival of the post-Ice Age beech and oak forest that used to cover uh, enormous stretches of Europe, which had all been cut down for farmland and wood for trees and charcoal and so on. But this, this is a stretch of it, quite large. Uh, it, it takes. It, it's set on a, a massif, a big thing of rock that juts out like a, a big bump on the back of the leg of the Italian peninsula. Um, and 
up until the time the EU brought money in, there was really not much in the way of roads through it. There was mostly uh, mule tracks and smugglers brought stuff up. In. Uh, and so it's an actual ancient forest. It's got deer and wild boar in it. The light is like nothing I've ever seen, and I've been in a number of different forests. Uh, it's almost cathedral-like, solemn and dim. The cover overhead is, is, uh, is intense. I'm doing a story in which the old god Pan, who was a forest god of the ancient times, this is his, his last sanctuary. This is where he is. So they, they drove away all the other gods and pulled the temples down. Pan never had a temple. He, he just had the forest. So that's it's about a, a young couple who go there and discover this. I haven't yet figured out how it ends, but I think it ends with her pregnant. We'll see. Oh. Okay, so now um, do you do social media? Do you have a website? Um, how, do, how do you like readers to find you? Well, I used to have a website, and then something happened to the, uh, the server that hosts it, and now I can't do anything with it. So it's, it's there, but it's dormant, should we say. If I get a deal for this old uh, magnum opus of mine, I'll, I'll spend two or three grand and get something set up because it would be worth it. But no, if people want to find me, I'm on Facebook. And I have actually just dropped out of Twitter. Elon Musk allowed Alex Jones back in. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I'm out. Yeah, okay. I know. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the crazy town, yeah. Yeah. So, and if people want to learn about me, uh, there's a very extensive Wikipedia uh, entry about me, just as Matthew's writer. And it's got all of my books and all of my short stories, everything organized into you know, the different types and things that I do. Um, and it's maintained by a fellow called George, who is dedicated, and I think he's doing an immensely wonderful job. Every time I do something new, he puts it in there. We all get along with the help, you know, of our <laughs> friends. Well, we appreciate you being here. Now, of course, the book is A God in Hiding, and our guest... It's the writer of that book and many others, uh, Matthew Hughes. Thank you for being here. Been a pleasure. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.